the Prime Minister, as we know, is now in the Middle East uh, to try and urge Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to step up oil production and sell it to us in a bid to reduce what he's called our addiction to Russian oil and gas. But he's already been forced to defend Saudi's human rights record, saying he will raise concerns... This is just days after 81 people were killed in the largest mass execution for decades. Well, Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, joins us now. Uh, very good morning to you. Morning. Are you not, as the Labour leader uh, alleges, just skipping from one dictator to another to beg for resources? What, what we've seen in Ukraine is the most appalling violation of a sovereign nation, the first war in European territory for years and a shattering of European security that doesn't just threaten uh, countries like the United Kingdom or allies across Europe, it threatens global security. So we do need to work with every possible country we can in stopping Vladimir Putin and ensuring he loses in Ukraine. And of course, uh, we don't agree with every policy of Saudi Arabia or the United Emirates, but we are facing a huge challenge to global security. And we need to be realistic in finding alternative sources of oil and gas. And, of course, yeah. uh, the Gulf is a key source of that oil and gas, we along are, with more yeah, homegrown production, along with uh, more help from the likes of Japan and the United Foreign States. Secretary, we are alleged to have double standards. Uh, Saudi is described as a brutal regime. Uh, we have that uh, situation where 81 people executed uh, in a single day. It, it is said that they do not have fair trials in Saudi Arabia, guilty of bombing civilians in Yemen. Um, 10,000 children have been killed or injured in that military action by a Saudi-led coalition. Implicated, of course, as you'll know, in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, Amnesty International says Saudi oil buys the world's silence on the human rights abuse there. We have taken a very moral stance on Russia. Why does that collapse when it comes to Saudi? Well, these are two very, very different cases. What Vladimir Putin is seeking to do, and he's been seeking to do this for some time, and frankly, the West has been asleep at the wheel, but he is seeking to regain vast sways of what was the Soviet Union under Russian control. And he won't stop at Ukraine if we don't stop him. He wants to <coughs> go further east, uh, sorry, further west. He wants to uh, subsume uh, vast parts of Eastern Europe back we under Russian control. We understand the policy on real, Russia. This the is question a real threat. Is, why do we have a double standard when it comes to another regime? A, you yourself said in a speech in Washington that the West needed to end its strategic dependence on authority, authoritarian regimes for energy and other vital resources. And we are simply going to increase our dependence on another authoritarian regime, are we not? What I'm saying is that Russia is the greatest threat to global security, it is the greatest threat to Britain's security that there is. And we have to work with all of the potential partners that we can to diversify away from Russian oil and gas and ensure Europe does that as well. So what you're really... Otherwise, we will see Vladimir Putin's continued expansionism across Europe that doesn't bear thinking about. Now, of course, that means we have to make uncomfortable decisions. Of course, it means that we have to work with countries we don't necessarily agree with. But we are facing a serious global security threat of the type that we have not seen for decades. And we are right to explore all the possible opportunities, however uncomfortable okay. exploring those opportunities might be. What you're really arguing here is the philosophy of real politic, isn't it? You're really basically channeling Henry Kissinger, who, who would have probably argued along very similar lines, that these are the realities that you simply have to grapple with. Uh, and we have to get the oil from somewhere. Is that a, is, does that summarise your, your position? I am saying that we have to be real about the situation we face. We are in a different world from the world we were in six months ago, where European security has been shattered, the assumptions we had about deterrence have been shattered, and we are facing a 
threat on our continent okay, you said of a this. severity that we haven't seen yep. for many years. Yep. And we are going to have to do things differently. Uh, I've talked about how we are going to have to rethink European security architecture. We're going to have to rethink uh, the approach we take to economic dependence, and not just on Russia, but also on strategic dependency on countries like China as well. And we are going to have to look for alternatives. Of course, in the longer term, it means more nuclear, it means more renewables. But in the shorter term, we do need to find alternative sources for oil and gas. And you're right, Richard, we have to be realistic about where those sources are. Um, you know this question's coming at you, so let's, let's get to it. Um, we just interviewed a filmmaker in Ukraine, on the front line, who says that he has personal uh, experience of talking to and working with hundreds, literally hundreds, of young British men who've gone out there, some of whom have military training, some of whom have just basically played war games on their PlayStations, but they're out there and they're picking up guns. Now, you gave a straight answer to a straight question on the BBC Sunday Morning programme two or three weeks ago. Um, you said you, you were asked if you thought that people should go to Ukraine, basically, and, and pick up arms. You were asked to be clear on that, and you said, absolutely, if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then you were kind of slapped down for saying that by your own government a couple of days later. But... Be absolutely... I mean, you gave a straight answer then. Give a straight answer now. Do you actually think that these young men should be going and fighting there? Because you, you clearly thought so then. Have you changed your mind or have you, been told, have you been told to change your mind? The, the Foreign Office did issue very clear advice that people should not uh, travel to Ukraine. And there are better ways of helping Ukraine, namely of donating to the DEC fund. And we've seen 130 million donated to the DEC fund already by the British people. British people can now open their homes... Uh, to Ukrainian refugees, we've now opened that scheme. Yeah, so that so, is so a have you, have you that is a better mind? way to help your, Richard. And have what you changed I was, your mind, Ms. Trust? Have what, you changed what your I mind was on this? saying, what I was saying um, when I spoke a few weeks ago, yeah. was that I support the cause, and I do feel a deep sense of support for President Zelensky, for the Ukrainian government, and for the brave Ukrainian people. But clearly, it isn't wise to go against British travel advice to go to Ukraine. Uh, but I do understand that this is a just cause uh, that Ukrainians are fighting. Okay, so back then you were speaking from the heart, weren't you? Well, as I say, I do believe this is a just cause the Ukrainians are fighting, but we don't advise uh, Brits to go to Ukraine. Uh, we do have a travel... Uh, we do have travel advice that says don't go there. Okay, so you have completely changed... Uh, your position because you said in that interview that you supported the struggle and then asked to clarify if that meant do you support people taking up arms, you said absolutely if that's what they want to do. So you are withdrawing that statement this morning. Well, I've already uh, said in subsequent interviews that I strongly advise people not to go to Ukraine. All right. And what would be the consequences for mm. them mm. if they're out there now? What advice now do you give those? And we've heard there are potentially hundreds of Brits out there taking up arms. What do you say to them? Well, as I've said, the Foreign Office travel advice is very clear that they, it is dangerous and they shouldn't be there. Do they face criminal action if they ignore that advice? Well, that's a matter for the legal system. And I think as a government minister, it's very dangerous to... Uh, comment on what action uh, the British legal system and prosecutors would take. We deliberately have a separation on that front. As Foreign Secretary this morning, uh, what do you make of Zelensky's... Uh, what it looks like the offer of an olive branch to Putin when Zelensky made it absolutely clear that now Ukraine has, 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 has accepted that it can never join NATO. So that's off the table, which would clearly allow Putin, were he want to spin it this way, to say that he's won... Uh, that Ukraine is no longer a, a, a militarised state because it won't join NATO. It'll be, if you like, a buffer zone. Do you... Do, what, what are your instincts as Foreign Secretary this morning? Do, do you share the optimism which is beginning to bleed out of the front pages of the newspapers that this may be the beginning of the end? Well, it's a decision for Ukraine about whether or not they want to be a member of NATO. But I have always thought that this NATO issue is a smokescreen... Putin has been very clear in public that his ambition is to subordinate Ukraine, to bring it under Russian control, along with vast swathes of Eastern Europe. So I don't believe uh, the NATO issue is the core issue. If Putin is serious about negotiations, he needs to call a ceasefire and remove his troops from 
Ukraine. It is very hard to negotiate with a gun to your head. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing immense pressure being put on the Ukrainian government by the Russians. And it would be a mistake uh, for us to allow the Ukrainians to be bullied into some kind of settlement. And this is exactly what's happened before. It happened in 2014 and the Minsk Accords, mm. simply for Putin to be further emboldened by that. You know, we need to make sure that Putin loses in Ukraine, that his ambitions stop in Ukraine, and we once and for all reduce our dependence or remove yeah, our dependency okay. on Russian oil and gas, and we really stop uh, his further his further appalling, appalling actions across Eastern Europe, well, because he's not just threatening Ukraine. You know, the Russians have also been uh, stirring up issues in the Western Balkans, uh, you know, yes, we know that. operating through Belarus. There are, it, this is a serious, serious problem with a expansionist Russian dictator. Very, very quickly, um, what do you make of the reports that we may be seeing this poor benighted woman who's been held, prison, held in prison and at home, under home arrest uh, in, in Iran, that she might be coming home? She's got a British passport back. Uh, do you have optimism on that front? Nazanin well, Zaghari Ratcliffe. Yes, yeah, Zaghari Ratcliffe, I should uh, say. I, I've made it an absolute priority to secure the release of Nazanin, Anoushe and Murad, who are all detained uh, in Iran. Uh, I've also been very clear that the debt that we owe Iran, uh, the so-called IMS debt, is a legitimate debt. And we have been working very hard uh, I, to make it? this happen. Have we paid it? Because I keep reading reports that we have. We've actually handed over the 400 million for those tanks that we've owed them since 1979. I, Has it been paid? Can you confirm that? I'm afraid that? to say I can't, I can't say anything about that at this stage. Uh, what I can say is, since I became Foreign Secretary, I think I met the Iranian Foreign Minister in my first week at the job to seek to resolve these issues. And we've been consistently working since. Uh, we've got a team in Tehran, and we do want to resolve these issues. Well, but so I can't say anything is... more at this stage, I'm afraid. All right, but the implication is clearly that we have paid it, and that's why she's got a passport back. I mean, that's, you know, two and two make four in, in this equation, doesn't it? Not you... necessarily, I'm afraid to say, Richard. <laughs> no. Well, OK. And very quickly... Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister, was on this programme last week, I think it was, calling for Nuremberg-style war crimes trials, when all this is over in Ukraine, uh, bringing Putin personally and his cronies to account in exactly the same way as we brought the Nazis to account in 1945-46. Do you support that? Well, we're, we're supporting a case at the International Criminal Court. Uh, we have worked with other countries. We're collecting evidence. We think there is strong evidence that war crimes have been committed. Mm -hmm. And we are determined to hold Putin to account on that. OK. Foreign Secretary, thank you for your time this thank morning. You.